out of a survey that was done among inpatients. 47 percent, 47, that's almost 50 percent of inpatients reported an error at some point in their care. Again, we cannot get used to numbers like that. Let me, let me, let me give it to you another way. Imagine you're getting on an airplane. Okay, you get on the airplane, and the flight attendant announces to you, it says, welcome, you come to Metro Airlines. By the way, there's a 50% chance that something bad could happen on this flight. It could be the pilot, it could be the food, it might be the toilet, I don't know, but there's a 50% chance that something could go wrong. Have a safe flight, thank you for flying with us. How many of you would stay in that aircraft? Nobody. Let's break it down even further, okay? So that's the airline industry. How many of you have had lunch? Or is everyone fasting? How many people had lunch today? No? After, you're not eating? After work? You had lunch. Thank you. You had lunch? Finally! I was going to go to the hotel. Eat some lunch before you come to the lecture. Where did you eat? We ate lunch. Wow. Why did you eat lunch? does not accept 47%. Why do we? Why is 47% good enough in the healthcare industry when it's not good enough in the hair industry? It's definitely not good enough in the nail industry. I would not, no, 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 no. It's not good enough in the airline industry. And we're supposed to be the smart people? We're supposed to be the people that others come to for help. There's no way that 47% should be good enough for us. It just can't be, okay? So, the question is this. Let me make sure I had everything. How much risk should our industry accept? I gave you the 10% out, out of the US, the 8 to 12% out of the EU, 47% out of Nigeria. So there, there are levels of risk in, in every area. But I think we can all agree that 47% is too high. Does anyone agree? Is it, am I the only person who like that number just right? Okay. Even the 10% is too high. That's one out of 10. How many people are here? That means a good, what, four or five of us even right here out of just the number of people here. That's just not good enough. And so we need to strive for better systems that reduce the risk, okay? That keeps our patients safe. Now. The aspects, we talked about error, okay? We talked about unintentional consequences. And I want to differentiate that from at-risk behavior or reckless behavior, okay? Because again, the types of error that we can prevent, you know what, we can prevent the at-risk and the reckless behavior as well. But the specific errors that we're looking at are the ones that are coming because we're human. We're human beings, we're not robots. So mistakes will happen, sometimes despite our best intentions. So some of the solutions we'll talk about in the months to come, in the years to come, will have to do with addressing those types of errors. But besides that, there's at-risk behavior, talking about unsafe practices. When you bypass checks and balances, okay? We talked about how you diagnose pneumonia. If my lovely surgeon friend had just listened to the patient instead of just relying on the x-ray, he would have known this thing is slick. Okay, if we don't shortcut systems, that's at-risk behavior. When we know we should check the glucometer to make sure it's working, but we don't check it. 
complex type of this behavior, eventually there will be a bad outcome. That's not even the type of error that I'm talking about. Because we've got to completely eliminate at risk behavior. You can't short circuit the system. The things you're learning in school, you're learning them for a reason. You can't become a physician and then just stop doing those things you're supposed to do. You can't look at someone and decide, it looks like pneumonia. Or it looks like an ear infection. That's not how we practice. That's at risk behavior. Okay. Reckless behavior is where it's conscious and intentional. Where I'm doing one procedure and I decide, oh, let me just do this other one while I'm at it. And I might not be licensed to do that particular procedure. That's not at risk, that's reckless behavior. We're not even talking about those. Those are still elements within our system that we need to deal with. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about medical error and the things that we need to think about developing systems to address those levels of error, okay? And then there's negligence. For me, 47%, it doesn't just become a risk, it becomes negligence. Because like I said to you, none of us, or we all agree, none of us would enter a system where there was a 50% risk. None of us would work with an industry where there was a 50% risk. So we've got to ask ourselves, when we allow our patients to be exposed to that high a level of risk, has it become negligent? I think we just need to ask ourselves that question. I won't answer it, okay? And who controls all of this? See, it's not an institution. It's not just this, you know, Ministry of Health. It, it, it's us, and, and that's what I need us to own. It's us, we, the healthcare practitioners, and especially we, the physicians, as the leaders within the healthcare system. We're the ones who either will propagate it or curb it. And we'll talk about how we can do that, okay? You can't see this thing at the bottom, but you see with this 10-month-old child, there were so many people involved in this child's care. And we all contributed to the bad outcome. There was the house officer, okay, who caused the pneumothorax in the first place, right? There was the supervising pediatrician who was around. There's the x-ray technician. There's all of us who saw the x-ray and saw that it was switched, but none of us went with the patient to tell the surgeon, please make sure, because we all knew that it was switched. We could have gone beyond the call of duty and taken it a step further, knowing that there was a risk that could happen. There really was a risk. We knew it going in. Everyone saw the x-ray was flipped. Okay. Of course, there's a surgeon, there was a nurse, and then there was my medical student. There's also the mother who said something that broke my heart. Actually, the story is even worse because you think about it. The child had a needle aspiration on the left. The child had a big bandage on his whole left side. It was clear there was something going on on the left, and yet still, it was on the left. And when you asked the mother, she said something very sad. She said that, and she actually said it in Chi, I think. She said, I don't mean in say wrong side. I'm see the doctor no in the She said, I knew it was on the wrong side, but I thought maybe the doctor knew something that I didn't know. So I said nothing, and I let it happen. See, our patients are depending on us I just make it simple, to do our jobs. They're simply entrusting their lives into our hands with the big assumption that we have their best interests at heart and that we'll make sure that they have good care. So every one of us in this paradigm, except the child, because the child couldn't talk for themselves. And when people are sick, they're vulnerable and they're depending on everyone else to have their best interests at heart. All of us contributed to that bad outcome. And all of us could have contributed to making sure that that didn't happen at all, okay? So when you think about a healthcare system, it's everyone. And I, I gave the example uh, earlier in the talk when I talked about the work that I do. It's everyone, the cleaner, the chef, the transporter, the surgeon, the doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist. Everyone comes together to either keep that patient safe or to cause that person harm. But when we have a hierarchical type system with us, the doctor, and we're on top of everything. In fact, let me show you what our system actually looks like. It's not a patient-centered model, it's a doctor-centered model. And we love it. 
And we keep it that way because we love everything centering around us, but it's not safe. And it propagates the kind of things that we're seeing with our patients. It's part of what produces the 47%. Because it's a doctor-centered system. And way over there in the corner somewhere is the family. Because we don't care about them. Their opinion doesn't matter. They didn't go to medical school like us. But that mother could have prevented this if she was empowered to say, doctor, and yes, I say we have had your prayer to the physician. If she had been empowered to just say that, but she wasn't. And she wasn't in any position to stop it from happening. And guess what we do afterwards? We make that same mother go buy another chest tube to fix the original problem and hope and pray that the one we put on the right side doesn't cause another pneumothorax to which we had no chest tube. This is what we're talking about when we talk about patient safety. We talk about victims, and they're victims of ours. What are we going to do about it? We're not as helpless as we might think we are. Okay. It's a little hard to see this, but what this slide describes is the process that could take place between when we prescribe a medicine and when it's actually given to the patient. And when we have a system that just starts with us and goes directly to the patient, medication being administered with no questions asked, that's an error to take place. But if you can imagine a system where you prescribe a medication, the pharmacist actually checks the medication, checks the dose, checks the patient's allergies. And we're talking about a hospital-based system. And the nurse does the same. The nurse doesn't just walk in and give it, but the nurse actually checks what medicine is in. Which patient is this for? Hello, because sometimes we give the medicine to the wrong person. Who is this for? What are their allergies? What's the timing? What's the dose? Where the patient is also empowered to say, wait a minute, I'm allergic to this medicine. I can't have it. Can you see all the potential checks and balances that could be in the system that would keep our patients safe? But when it goes straight from us to the medication being administered, there can be a lot of error taking place. And this is not just here in Ghana. It happens everywhere. That's a pretty little girl, isn't she? Her name is Josie King. So the thing was an 18-month-old girl, and they say was because she's no longer with us. An 18-month-old girl at Johns Hopkins Hospital, one of the best hospitals in the world. She actually got birth in a bathtub accident. She went to Johns Hopkins. I can't remember what percent of her body was burned. Underwent treatment, was doing very well. In fact, they'd taken her out of ICU, brought her to the regular ward. They figured she might be discharged in a day or two. They started planning discharge. And the mother said, you know, Josie seems like she's very thirsty. Something is wrong. Everyone said that she's fine, she's fine, she's fine. There's nothing wrong with her. They sent the mother home to go get clothes and everything to come back and take her daughter home. While she was on her way home, this child had a cardiac arrest right there on the general pediatric unit, hours before she was supposedly going to go home. And she died of nothing but dehydration, right there at John Hopkins Hospital. Dehydration. She had been in the hospital for about two or three weeks and died of dehydration at one of the best institutions of the world. This is going to be hard to read, but I'll interpret all of this for you. So this was the response of the head of pediatrics by John Hopkins to all of this. I mean, what do you say to a mother whose child has died? And not just that their child has died, but you know it shouldn't have happened. And you know that there's been an error. Do we just shrug our hands and say, for my yummy? Or do we make a decision to figure out why? And most importantly, do what we need to do so that that never, ever, ever happens again anywhere in our institution. And thank you, that's exactly what John Hopkins is doing. Their whole system of practice around children in the burn unit was completely changed because of this one case. How do we respond to these issues? Because not responding is part of how we propagate the system of errors that are existing 
in our community today. Okay, so who should take responsibility? All of us. It's not just the administration. It's not just the ministry. It's all of us. Every single one of us have a part to play in making sure that our patients are safe. Every single one of us need to take responsibility. Listen, you're human. At some point in your career, there's gonna be an error. And if our whole response to error is pointing fingers at each other, we're not gonna go anywhere. We're gonna keep, in fact, the 47% will now become 57%. What we need is a system where we look at errors and we take a step back and we learn from them. And we determine that these things will never, ever happen again. So we're all responsible. This is a quote that I love from way back in 1962. Then President John F. Kennedy of the United States was touring NASA. And in the course of his tour, he saw a damage, uh, someone who was cleaning the room. And he stopped his tour to go talk to the guy who was cleaning. And he said to him, wow, what do you do? And he expected to hear the guy say, I'm a janitor or I'm a cleaner. But the guy said this. He said, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. What a profound way of thinking. I'm not just here to clean. Our ultimate purpose is we're putting a man on the moon. And that can't happen in a dirty NASA. So my job is crucially important to putting a man on the moon. What are we talking about? We're talking about every single person. Every single person in that hospital is a healthcare provider. <clears throat> every single person contributes to whether our patients are going to live or whether they're going to die. And when we begin to understand things that way, then our approach is different. So my question to you is this. What kind of healthcare provider are you going to be? What's the paradigm with which you're going to practice medicine? For those of you who are faculty and teaching, what kind of doctors are we producing? It's an important question. Okay, we all start out with a certain innocence. And innocence is a good thing. But I guarantee you, if you start out with a determination that your patients are actually going to live and not die, and they're going to live and not die because of how you practice medicine, and if you also put into place the systems that make this happen, then you're gonna see it happen. But if your attitude is just, I'm just gonna go to school, do whatever, and just let life be life, you're gonna to continue to see that 47%, and nothing is going to change. Okay? It takes courage. It takes integrity. You know what, what else it takes? What is that, does that look familiar? Has anyone seen that quote? from the Ghana Health Service. It talks about being manned by people who have integrity, who are trained to high standards. Look at this, who work for the benefit of patients, clients, and society as a whole. It sounds so nice on paper, but that's what we're supposed to be. Let me bring it home further. How about that? Does that look familiar? I think it's up there. This is ACM, to provide world-class medical education that is relevant, research-oriented, tailored towards solving Ghana and Africa's health problems. 47% is a problem. It's a big problem. Are we gonna solve it, or are we just gonna propagate it? Because that's why you're here, that's why you're here at ACM, is to be the kind of physician who changes that statistic, okay? Who have heart power. I love this, I tried to replicate this. Your core values. Yeah, I know that too. I have a little bit of CIA. I know what's going on around here. Okay. It takes leadership. It takes integrity, excellence. 47% is not excellent. And we can't accept it as norm because it's not excellent. And that's what we need to strive for. That's what we need to look forward to. So patient safety matters, why? Because none of us went into medicine so we could kill our patients. Did any of you sign up for medicine just so people could die and become worse under your care? No. So patient safety matters because we want our patients to survive. We want them to be whole. And it matters because 
even our best effort. I told you that before. Error happened. We didn't intend for it to happen. I'm sure the surgeon put the test tube in perfectly. I mean, from a procedure perspective, it was beautiful. They did exactly what they were taught to do. The problem is they did it at the wrong place. So our best intention will not solve this problem. Okay? And then finally, the reality is hospitals are not safe. Our offices are not safe. And when we understand that, then we set up systems so that they become safe. Every other industry has done it. The airline industry has done it. And fortunately for us, we've learned a lot from the airline industry, from things like checklists okay, and readbacks. Those things didn't come from us. Apparently, the pilots are smarter than us. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, we've had to learn from their industry how to put in place some of these checks and balances so that our patients are safer. So what do we do? Let's start from the patient perspective. What do we do about all this? I'm rounding up now. From, from, from a patient perspective, the first thing is we, as physicians, we need to allow our patients to ask questions. We can't make ourselves the gods of their health care. They need to be empowered. From a patient perspective, patients need to ask questions, all right? Patients need to be the custodians of their own health and make informed decisions. It's very important. My father is here. Every time he's going to see the doctor, I'm asking a whole lot of questions on my end. And he's trying to tell me they don't want to ask the doctor that many questions. Why? Remember what that mother said. Every time you question why a patient is daring to ask you a question. What did that mother say? I knew it was on the wrong side. But she said nothing. But we haven't empowered our patients to speak and to ask questions and to take their own health care into their own hands. Okay. I love it when my patients ask questions. They keep me on my toes. They ask questions to things I haven't thought about. It makes me smarter when my patients ask me questions. I encourage it. It's important. It's necessary. What do we do? From an education standpoint, we're here at the Accra College of Medicine, okay? And I think we, we need to begin to study these things. This is just a mere introduction. This is just to get you irritated at 47%. We, we haven't even begun to talk about how we address these things. The systems that we put in place to bring that 47% down to a 10% and hopefully down to the person. And there's a lot that we can do It's very possible. It's not a big international no, no, no. But I spend most of my time, I probably spend about 50% of my work right now dealing with patient safety issues, um, looking at problems, looking at what we call near misses. We investigate even the things that didn't happen. Okay, the things that almost happened, oh, we investigate that too. Because how it even got that far, we need to understand it. If we don't understand how it got that far, we won't be able to prevent it the next time. The next time it might actually happen to the patient. We investigate near misses. We investigate things that actually happen. We applaud people who make mistakes and come and tell us. That's worthy of an applause. We don't hide our errors. We can't learn from errors that we don't know about. And we encourage reporting, not so people can get in trouble, but so we can solve the problem. And some of the best people who've worked with us are the people who've committed mistakes themselves. So there's nothing, there's nothing more terrifying than being a healthcare provider and knowing you've done something that caused harm to the patient. And the best way to rehabilitate yourself out of it is to be part of solving the problem. I told you about Josie King. There's more to the story. There was actually a, a house officer who administered a medication somewhere in between. And for the longest time, Josie's mother was convinced that it wasn't just dehydration, but it had something to do with this medication that was administered. It was years down the line that Josie's mother and the house officer met and had a profound opportunity for healing for both of them. Because this young physician carried a lot of guilt. And we've since come to understand that healthcare providers become what we call second victims when we have a bad outcome. So we can't just point fingers at each other. We need to help each other continue and to move forward and to practice good medicine. Okay? In July, there's a patient safety seminar, correct? Is it in July? Yeah. 
we all need to attend because you're going to have much more information. This is just a, a, a preview to that. Okay? So I want to encourage everyone to attend that seminar. But in the future, we're looking at probably even having specific courses that are centered around patient safety. So you can really understand the systems. That there's, there's a science to safety. Okay? There's a science to the safety of our patients and understanding how that science works. So that should be coming to us pretty soon. And I encourage us to, to um, participate. And of course, raising a new set of physicians. You know, I tell my residents this, healthcare is not healthcare if you don't care. It's not healthcare if we don't care about our patients. So we need a paradigm shift in that as well. Of course, there's a lot to do at the hospital level. I won't go over that, but this is a little bit more of what I do. And when I work in hospitals, we talk about the specifics. So we won't go over this slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one. I think what we need to do as health practitioners, number one, is we can't accept the status quo. We can't become comfortable with that 47%. We have to continue and remain, keep, keep a level of innocence that allows you to get frustrated when you hear about these stories. Don't accept the status quo. Okay? And then also redefine your own purpose. Remember I told you that I started out in your seat. It's seeming that I just go to medical school, learn all this stuff, make my diagnosis, and every patient will get better. I, I, I think we all need to rethink what it is that we want to do and how we want to get there, realizing that there's so much more that has an impact on your patient than just you as a patient. So understanding that. But when it comes to, I'll see some of you are taking the ethics class. I, I, I want to give you an ethical perspective. So there are lots of, of perspectives that you can use. I have a simple one that I'll end with. But the golden rule is one of the ones that we like to use, right? As far as, as ethics and treating others how. What's the golden rule? Yeah, treating others the way you want to be treated. Does anyone see a problem with that particular ethical perspective? Because if I don't mind being treated badly, then I can treat you badly. The golden rule is great, but it, it has its own limitations. Because it assumes that I treat myself the best way possible. But some of us don't. There's also something called a fashion rule. It's not so much treat others the way you want to be treated, but treat them the way they want to be treated. That's pretty powerful too. But again, if that person doesn't know their own worth, if that person doesn't mind being treated badly, then we kind of get away with it. So I have a simple ethical concept. My father is here, so I can say it. I'm affected by my mother. I am scared about it. She's in the 70s. I'm very of her. My children are scared of her. She's a sweet baby, but I'm scared. And then there are my children. I absolutely have four of my children. I have three boys. Two of them are taller than I am. But they're like my baby. I absolutely adore them. My ethical construct for how I take care of patients is that I treat every patient like they're my mother or my child. Every single patient I see. That's my ethical concept. You scared of my mother? I love her too, but I think you can hear part of this is that. Her spirit is this thing. When my end is this thing, there are a lot of dogs. You need to make that healthy fear when you're dealing with patients. With my children, I just adore my children. I want the best for my children. And I see that ethical concept. And what does it do for me? If it's not good enough for my mother, to sit and wait for me to show up for five hours, it's not good enough for that patient. If the care I'm providing is not compassionate enough, if it's not how I would want my child to be treated, I certainly wouldn't want my child, who was 10 months old, to have the two put on the wrong place. I wouldn't want that. So why is it okay for somebody else to have? I was in the hospital in Nigeria, the 16 year old girl was the girl who had showed up in the hospital with an ectopic pregnant. They rushed her to surgery. The studio needed me to tell me the ectopic was on the right, I think. They did they, they removed the left ovary. She'll never have a child again. That's not good enough for anyone's daughter. Why is it good enough for that woman's daughter? 
That's my simple ethical common sense. We have all kinds of common And I just teach it that simple. It doesn't matter how they treat me. That's irrelevant. My construct is how I am going to treat them. All right? We are all done. Any questions? No questions? None at all? We have a little bit of time, I think. We have about seven minutes. So if, if someone gives a whole lecture and there's no question, then the lecture was horrible. So someone has to ask a question. Amazing physician as I work throughout that. And I definitely don't think that's the main problem. Remember, I talked about the whole system. So it's not just a doctor care for everyone. I talked about a 16 year old girl. I have seen 16 year old girls get beat up because of the fact that they're in the right here. I wouldn't say who's the disease. So it's not, I wouldn't say that that's the main problem for patients. But I would say this. We are the leaders in healthcare. And our staff, the people around us, they look to us for, they look to us for direction. We model the kind of behavior that our staff are doing. So from that perspective, if we demonstrate healthcare, we start to see it more. We start to see it in people who work as well. They'll know that it's not acceptable to see that person going on if we're not being paid. In my setting, um, actually in my unit, I'm probably one, maybe three black physicians. Most of my cleaning staff are black. They love me. Not because I'm black, because I talk to them, I greet them, I thank them, I go out of my way to make sure they understand their valuable in the system. And that changes how they work. They also see my office pretty clean. But, <laughs> But it changes how they work. If a patient's room isn't clean, we can't bring someone up from the ER. Okay. If I just go to them and say, please eat clean the room, they will get done in two seconds. You think that would happen if I was rude to them? So we're, we're an ecosystem. Right? But our role as a physician, again, it's not because we're in the office, not nice. I think if you demonstrate a level of care as the head of the team, you can see a different level. There are, there are many problems that can treat structuralism. I think caring is a good place to start with. Okay? Thank you. a student of Accra College of Medicine. Um, today's session has been one enlightened session I've ever had since we started this whole public lecture. Actually, as an expiring medical doctor, I've come to realize the essence of patient care and the need to always go the extra mile for patients, knowing that the very life of everyone that passes through my hands is very, very important. And every single decision I make would either save the life of a patient or kill the patient. It's made me realize that there's a need for me to beef up my decision and my judgment concerning how, and the treat how I attend to patients and the treatment I give to every single patient. One thing she said that so struck me is, treat every patient as you treat your mother or your father or a relation or as you treat your child. That should let you know that I wouldn't treat patients based on how they respond to me or how they react to me, but I'll treat them based on the appropriate care and care they need um, even as they seek for treatment at my end. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ebenezer, student of Accra College of Medicine. Level 300. Um, having been here for three years, I have to say I have learned a lot, something that I never got from undergrad. And coming up with these lectures, the public lectures that started this semester, 
I'm learning a lot because every day there are certain things that we do have in the class that might not necessarily be taught. But when we come for these public lectures, they are exposed and we are having avenue to express ourselves more. For instance, what we had today was about um, medical uh, errors. And then a lot of times that we make the errors and then we are not able to bring them out because we are afraid we'll be punished. And so people hide and then things that they, that might even have caused a um, patient to die go on and then they're not able to um, bring them out. But having learned these things, I think that I'm really empowered and then encouraged that having a 47% rate of errors, especially in, uh, in Nigeria, as the research um, shown, is something that is very appalling. And so if as a medical student coming up, I'm being exposed to these things, I would know that when I become a doctor, I have to, I have some certain standards that I have to uphold, and then it would help impact greatly on, on, on my profession. So I'm very grateful for the school for having instituted these things, and I hope that as time goes on, we'll have such resource persons come in and then teach us more of these, or expose more of these aspects of our health profession to us, so that when we come out, we'll be the very best of medical practitioners. Thank you very much. My name is Faith, I'm from the Accra College of Medicine. I've really benefited a lot from today's lecture and I just want to share a few tips from what I learned. First of all, I learned that every patient is important and as doctors, we don't treat the disease, we treat the patients and we treat them as human beings. We, we should have that relationship with them because there might be something the patient knows that we don't know. So it's very paramount to treat the patient as a human being. Something else I also picked from um, the lecture is that the study of medicine goes just beyond the classroom, it goes beyond the anatomy and the physiology and every other thing but it's it's really important we we, we um, it's really important we consider patient care as a very important part of our our lecture and all that we really need to to look more into the patient care as a whole not just the what we learned in class and the clinical aspect of medicine and another thing I also learned is we should also encourage patients to ask questions you know, in Ghana, in Nigeria, and in Africa as a whole, the, our patient, our patients see us as some teen gods and all that. We are not gods. We are just instruments that are being used to help people. So we should also welcome patients' ideas. We should allow them to ask questions, and that would help us better understand their condition and all we are supposed to treat. Um, I hope this will be useful to everyone. Thank you.